Okay, and here we are. Uh, as you can see, Richard has rejoined us and he's rejoined us for the final session of today's broadcast. And in many respects, it could be seen as a, the, oh, the, the holy grail in regards to corporations achieve, achieving their net zero ambitions. Uh, for the next 45 minutes, we'll be sharing practical ideas and strategies as how to embed a net zero culture across an organization. And it's uh, not, not an easy task, uh, but one we can hope give you some ideas too and some pointers on. So uh, on your screens now, you can see three uh, excellent panelists and uh, they are uh, Michael Dickstein, Group Sustainability Director, Coca-Cola, Hel Hellenic, Bottling Company. Uh, Thomas yeah, hello, Muller. Hello, 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 Michael. Um, Thomas Muller Kirschbaum, Corporate Senior Vice President uh, in Innovation and Sustainability at Henkel. And we also have Richard Howard again of Frank Bold, and he is rejoining us and chairing the discussion. And it is our last uh, discussion of the day. It's live, it's 45 minutes. And as always, and as with the previous sessions, do get your questions in, and Richard will be on hand to try and answer or we'll ask as many of them as he can during the discussion. But for now, over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Liam, and good morning, good day to everyone uh, around the world. Thank you to the fellow panelists who have joined this session. This is the panel discussion in the conference, which is how do we develop and sustain a business culture for net zero. The chief executive of Airbnb said, the stronger the culture, the less corporate process a company needs. When the culture is strong, you can trust everyone to do the right thing. And so many, for many of us watching and participating in this conference who work on net zero and sustainability strategies, it's if we get the culture right, it's an opportunity to have strategies that are more focused, more practical, uh, and if we get it wrong, it undermines the very strategies that we are seeking to implement. But how do you actually do that when we're talking about companies in this panel uh, of more than 50,000 employees of, of very diverse sectors from food and beverages to industrial manufacturing to personal care? to companies that have multiple departments and literally thousands of suppliers. How can you develop a net zero business culture bearing all of that in mind? In the next 45 minutes, we will discuss some good concepts that often become buzzwords in these debates, concepts like vision, concepts like greening the business, but what do they really mean in practice? We'll learn from two leading companies on how that they respond to those questions. Our first speaker is Michael Dickstein, the Group Sustainability Director at Coca-Cola, Hellenic Bottling Company. Coca-Cola is one of the biggest world brands, of course, and uh, uh, um, Michael represents a company which, it, which is one of its biggest bottlers in the world. They say they've completely changed the way they use plastics, the way they use electricity, and the way they use water. And they claim that uh, sustainability is absolutely key to their own business culture. Uh, Michal says from top down and from bottom up, let us tell him how, tell us how, Michal. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, and thank you uh, for not only for this invitation, but actually really for setting up this conference. In my preparations for this introductory statement, I thought a lot about the last couple of months and, you know, who would have thought that there was such a great interest in the topic? What you would normally see in times of economic crisis is that uh, the business focuses more on their most imminent needs. And sustainability in the past was always driven a little bit to, towards the sidelines. This time it's completely different. It doesn't matter whether you listen to the European Union, whether you listen to some of the member states, or also to the private sector. Despite economic pressures, many organizations continue to position sustainability as a fundamental part of the strategy, rightfully so. That's the first part of my introductory statement. As a second part, let me also relate a little bit, Richard, to what you said about uh, Coca-Cola Helene Bottling Company. Uh, yes, indeed, we are one of the leading bottling partners of the Coca-Cola company worldwide. We are actually a leading beverage company in Central and Eastern Europe as well as in Ireland and in Nigeria. And I stress this uh, geographic territories because they play a pivotal role in how you set out and how you roll out the culture and an appropriate mindset. Number three, uh, we have leading positions in practically all major ESG benchmarks, whether that's the Dutch on Sustainability Index, whether that's CDP, MSCI, FTSE for Good, and I think all of them um, are 
proving that we are with at least some of our, the things that we are doing on the right track. Now, thirdly, we've recently started our own journey towards net zero. We have explored various options. In first instance, our target is uh, that uh, we contribute to the uh, 1.5 uh, degree uh, temperature ceiling uh, set out in the Paris Agreement. But in the next uh, dimension, we also look uh, at opportunities, uh, how we can get to net zero. We haven't disclosed anything yet, but we are not far away from doing that. During the internal process, we could heavily rely on a company culture that endorses climate action. And for me personally, and, and, and analyzing the last couple of months, I see four prerequisites uh, towards that. Number one, a consistent track record in achieving uh, sustainability targets. That needs to be not only fully embedded in the company uh, strategy, it needs also uh, be a major part of the mindset of your people. But don't surprise them with something. Don't come up with something that is completely new. When we talk about net zero, I think it is fair to say that this is actually the Champions League of all sustainability activities at this moment in time. So uh, if you haven't uh, started doing your own homework in your own business, don't think of net zero, but build up your strategy and make sure that you take your people, uh, your, uh, your colleagues along the way, number one. Number two, um, a relentless ESG focus from the board and the entire company top. Now, in the past, you, you can read this a lot in the literature and in articles, and I always thought in the past, well, okay, that, that's kind of, of lip service. Having worked in different businesses myself, I've experienced the difference. And I can truly say that uh, now, starting with our CEO and the whole uh, operating company, there is such a great commitment for the topic that is making it easy to drive it top down, as you were mentioning, Richard, and that is also enabling a culture that is then bringing it back bottom up. Thirdly, I believe what helps uh, Coca-Cola Hellenic uh, bottling is an overall no-nonsense, agile and can-do mentality. Uh, there is a very healthy balance between setting out the strategy and achieving what you want to deliver. And this execution drive is, I think, one of the most important uh, ingredients uh, in order to get out and to think about uh, a stretch target like uh, net zero. Eventually, number four, an inclusive functional approach. An approach from all relevant parts of the business. Those of you from the uh, uh, audience who have worked with uh, the topic of net zero know that this is quite complex. It is uh, touching various parts of the value chain of a business. Therefore, you need to have many different functions on board, starting with purchasing operations um, up to your commercial team. Uh, they all play a very relevant role. And uh, therefore, the more inclusive you are in your approach, uh, the more beneficial your outcome is going to be. That's my introductory statement. Back to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. And I know that we're going to be uh, picking up on some of those themes uh, later. But let's hear from, from Thomas next. Thomas Nina Kirschbaum is Corporate Senior Vice President for Innovation and Sustainability at Henkel. Henkel, a well-known name, but also having this disparate number of uh, sectors it's involved with, from industrial adhesives to beauty care and to healthcare. They've subjected their own net zero targets uh, to the uh, Science-Based Targets Initiative, uh, and they are one of the companies com uh, committed not just to being net zero, but to being climate positive. Thomas. Richard, thank you very much. And also many thanks for Michael uh, um, addressing the point that um, as me, we, we both like the idea of this conference uh, and the idea to have this exchange. And I'm um, looking forward also to, do, to answer your questions. I think this is uh, very important. But just to give you an intro, um, in Henkel and uh, starting directly with the net zero part that Michael said, that is the, um, um, the, the top point of a sustainability strategy. Um, and um, in a certain to a certain part it is, and, and we had the um, we had the first uh, the first um, uh, idea about that, and we called it at that time a vision. Why we called it a vision in 2017 when we came up uh, with that topic and first published about it, and how to uh, at least achieve the first milestones 
We call it a vision because we want to take everybody with us, but we, we were very clear, we do not know every detail. Uh, I think this is also something uh, in, a, in a business environment that is a cultural thing to start a topic um, uh, not knowing every detail. Think about that in context of some business plans for the running year. So uh, analysts would have a, um, a clear reaction on that. So that was also the, the internal discussion and we could turn this vision then into a clear plan forward and a clear commitment um, for being recorded climate uh, positive but uh, you know, uh, climate positive, the most important thing is to be climate neutral and then you can get even a step step forward. But that, is, that was part of our new strategic framework uh, that we published um, earlier, uh, earlier this year where sustainability is completely embedded as one of the growth drivers uh, beside digitalization and, 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 and portfolio. Um, the, um, the growth driver is sustainability in itself. So it's anchored in the, uh, in the strategy of the company. Um, Henkel, um, now in the, I think we have um, more than 20 years or 25, four years, we are publishing our um, first part, it was an environmental report, now is a sustainability report from, for more than 15 years. Uh, so we are really, uh, the, the um, sustainability is part of the DNA of the company. We are um, uh, partially family owned. Uh, and, um, and so that comes also from, from that origin. For me, uh, what I would address today is five important uh, elements in culture that drives um, sustainability to a successful implementation and also achievements. The first one is involvement. The second one is awareness. The third one is credibility internally and externally. Uh, the fourth one is transparency about what you are doing. And the fifth one is uh, partnerships. About the involvement, um, there is a, that's what I would call also a major differentiator between Henkel and other companies. We learned very early that um, what Michael also said is important to have not only top down, but also bottom up movement in the company. Everybody has to be convinced to work on that. How we, and we said how we can achieve that, how we can, can transport that on all levels in the company. And we started with the idea of a so-called sustainability ambassador training. So we, uh, we offered um, a person, uh, they did 10 training in teams. So it was like classroom uh, in, in, in groups and, and, and teams like a, like a, a kind of quiz. Uh, then we had an e-learning tool uh, that is now um, worldwide um, uh, available for several years. Um, and the, the first thing we started on a voluntarily base and from 2017 onwards, it's obligatory if you want to enter uh, as one of the 50,000 employees, uh, the Henkel company, you will pass a test on sustainability um, ambassador training um, and um, you will have the learning, you will pass the test and you know what you do. So that's the important thing, you know about what, uh, what the, the challenge is, uh, what the opportunity is, especially for Henkel, the opportunity and what um, you, you will do on the, uh, to contribute in your special role, be it in finance, be it in manufacturing, be it in um, research and development, um, be it in marketing. So every, that you get involved in the topic and you can individually contribute. That's, I think, very important. And beyond knowing that and can do that in your job, we offer also, we learned that, that especially in the um, generation Y, Z, or you can call it generation P for purpose, they are really interested to know that they are not working on for a good company on financial base, uh, but also that the company that has a certain purpose to make, to make the world a little bit better and that they can contrib contribute to that. Um, so we offer also beyond your normal job, some corporate volunteering. Um, uh, if you have no idea, you can go to the intranet uh, website um, uh, and you can, can choose your program. They're for all, all countries, some proposals, but you can do it also with your colleagues and start your own thing. So there's huge room for entrepreneurship uh, within, the, within the company. So, and this is, I, uh, I would say the most important pillar. That's the reason why I, I explained a little bit more in detail at the beginning, because it's not only a differentiator, but it's my recommendation to every company, make everybody um, an, a sustainability ambassador, somebody who stands in for the topic. That helps, that helps quite a lot. Um, so coming to the other topics, so uh, I think awareness is very clear. We have a, um, a CO2 footprint and a, one of the RAC companies that also have this footprint audited. Um, so, and that starts the entire value chain. So from the products or from the um, raw materials we buy until the, the disposal of our products, also the use phase. And uh, you, you can see if you follow that in our 
environmental report uh, that the most contributors are the raw materials and the use phase. So we work a lot that we can help our consumers and customers uh, to make that uh, good climate contribution when using, when using our product and make, make progress on that. By the way, we are also working internally on, uh, on, on production topics. Uh, credibility is the second important, important part internally. So um, um, publish your figures, uh, commit to something, but also achieve it uh, to get credibility. Um, uh, and credibility uh, is even giving one idea. Uh, so we also are one of the uh, companies that had the first uh, sustainability loan. So the, uh, the conditions of, the, of this credit are dependent on our achievements uh, on certain uh, sustainability milestones that are measured by externals, of course. Um, Ecom research, such analytics, uh, and Ecovadis, uh, and uh, that, that is also something that uh, you, you have to be, have to be firm in what you are doing before you can do that. So credibility internally, externally, very important. Do what you uh, do, what you say. Walk the talk. Um, the first thing is transparency. In particular, also if uh, you see we have an annual milestones and uh, we normally achieve it, if we are would be in a situation not being able to achieve it, it would be very transparent talking about it. Why and what we do then instead of that, uh, maybe even to uh, uh, to counteract and uh, in one or the other part or to compensate uh, on another on another area. And the last thing is partnerships, and that needs also everybody on board and a cultural element uh, of kind of open innovation, I would say, as a researcher, um, an open innovation attitude to uh, uh, not having a not invented here syndrome, to take also good ideas from the external. And uh, so that is, we borrow with pride, uh, and that also with new ideas um, to bring sustainability forward. That's for the moment. Thank you very much, Thomas. And we're, we're sharing with pride in this panel, uh, and there's been some fantastic ideas there. Thank you to you both. Just a reminder, to all of the audience, and I think we've got over 3,000 people worldwide uh, registered for this conference. Please send any questions in through Slido. Some of them have started popping up, and I'll be be put, putting those later. But some questions from me as moderator first. Um, we've heard many things that I think we all know are cultural goods, things like engagement, things like credibility. Um, but let's actually tackle the cultural bads in your companies or in your experience of your careers. What are the bads that need to change if we're going to move to a successful new net zero mentality? Michael first. Let's take Thomas first. Well, it helps, no, I, 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 it, it helps to unmute uh, before before start speaking. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Richard. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, I can directly relate to uh, one specific thing that Thomas mentioned at the very start uh, of his intervention. Um, and that was this, um, I would call it the embracing the unknown. And that was certainly something that was um, for us a certain cultural learning. It didn't actually start three months ago when we first looked at our net zero journey. It started actually, I would say, one and a half years ago when we set out our um, comprehensive sustainability strategy, which we call Mission 2025. And I, I still recall that uh, in the preparations then, the word aspiration had a negative connotation. So as soon as you would come up with a target that was aspirational, people in the organization would immediately shrink back and say, oh, no, 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 we are not, we are not aspirational. We are down to earth, guys. So within our organization, the word aspiration kind of alluded to losing the sky. And that was a very interesting um, lesson learned for me. And uh, but also to see the journey and the shift that the business has made. I can, I can fully subscribe to what Thomas said. I mean, uh, there, there were certain periods uh, during the last couple of months when had you asked a business controller about what the year end result was going to be, that would probably not have been a, a very um, comprehensive answer to that. We have improved and I think the situation now uh, is much clearer on the business front. Um, as well as on the sustainability front, but the, the guts to commit to something where you've got the headlines and you understand the, uh, the methodology, but you do not know each and every detail and how to eventually get there was something that we had to learn. However, 
I believe looking at uh, whether it's Henkel or, or many other businesses that have uh, set out uh, uh, net zero targets already, uh, you need to do that. There are, most businesses rely on technical innovation that will only happen in the future in order to achieve the targets that we have set out today. So, so that was certainly the biggest learning. We have mastered it well. Really interesting. So Thomas, same question. I would like to join that even uh, so we, we both have a, a German German language background and uh, uh, we know uh, we had a famous in the 70s a famous um, very well-known statesman uh, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt uh, who has uh, said um, a very very a sentence that everybody has in mind and the sentence was um, if you have a vision you better go to the doctors um, what he meant by that he was even down to earth uh, really a guy uh, down to earth and, um, and he thought a visionary could be, let's say, losing the contact to the reality. What, of course, and that is uh, something that um, people, at least in my generation, have in mind. And if you talk to them about a, about a vision, climate positive, they say, "Hey, guy, uh, <laughs> you know that famous uh, the famous uh, quotation from from Helmut Schmidt. Um, think about that." So that was uh, even something. Uh, that made it difficult to uh, not, the, the, the need was very clear. So uh, the Paris Agreement, very well known to everybody, everybody knows. But uh, the, the question was how to do it practically for a company. And now a guy comes with a vision uh, on, on that part. So that, that, that took us some while, uh, the, the team that worked on that, to convince uh, stepwise uh, that not everything is clear. So part of that program is, uh, for example, that we have 100% renewable energy and we do not talk about buying certificates because that is not really helpful, but really having new investments by that uh, uh, driven uh, with, with, this, with this topic. And the question was, how can we do it in, let's say, one of our small countries that is in the middle of Africa where um, investments in renewable energy are not known yet? Huh? But the program is until 2030. I said, okay, we will have time. Maybe in 2027, we will have a clear way forward in that country. We have to, we have, to uh, have it in our plan. Don't forget it. But don't come up now with a 10 years plan, for example, on, on that topic or uh, even longer that is has every detail planned already now for 10 years from now that's not possible we have to have the big picture we have to adapt it every way that is one thing the other thing that I, what, what I learned um, together with the team here is that uh, for those people who are of course well-trained sustainability ambassadors but need the last kick uh, you better have also a kind of target setting system or incentivation um, that um, has at least one key figure in uh, in sustainability could be, for example, the CO2 footprint or thing, things like that, uh, something connected with that, that, that is part of your um, uh, short-term incentive um, and uh, reminds you during the year what to do uh, in, in that topic. So I, I would, and this is, this is uh, at the time being in discussion, uh, as we see that other companies have this already installed and that could help. Uh, I would say uh, the, the majority is anyway convinced they would do it, but uh, to give the, la the last kick to the entire team, it would be quite helpful. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to pick up uh, your example about the ambassadors, and uh, you use the word uh, kick. Can you kick people towards uh, sustainability? That's an interesting <laughs> not, not point. True. But, but the, the question behind it is this, that um, uh, we can all introduce schemes like that with which is like a checklist approach people have to do it they tick but do they really have it in their hearts have they really owned it and internalized it and there's there's how we do this in a way that genuinely enthuses and changes the thinking of our of our employees and that's of course very hard it's what both of you are trying to do would you give any tips uh, perhaps we'll start with Thomas this time. Can we get any tips to the other companies about how you avoid just giving people a kick, but that they really get it into their hearts and minds? Yeah. Uh, first, I, I apologize for the word kick, let's say nudging. Yeah? So that, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that uh, the, uh, how, how, to, how to nudge those who are maybe not 100% 100% it, but only 95% convinced yet to, uh, to go the last mile. Yeah? So that, um, this is what, what, I, what, what, what we have seen is um, it, it could be target setting and incentive, it could be one thing, but what is the most, let's say, convincing thing is to see that 
um, um, they are part of a team where maybe the others achieve something. So let, let's think about uh, uh, production. I was also 10 years responsible for the global uh, production for non-aid home care. And, um, uh, and I know how we, how we worked at that time to start this program on, on footprint reduction, especially on the, on the energy consumption and with that also on climate. Um, we found out that there's a, a team in, in, in one, uh, so we, we had, of course, a real-time real digital, digital reporting uh, of our energy consumption in all plants. And uh, with that, we could see that even uh, there, there was a, um, one plant that was the best plant of the week or the best plant of the months, um, months in energy consumption per um, a unit with which they produced. And, um, and then we said, okay, we do a, a best operating practice. And the team, the winner team, um, um, could be approached or the winner team was invited to go to those teams, let's say, in the last third of the, of the list uh, and to talk to them what they did in a different way. Uh, and this helped people very much. Uh, come, they, they do not um, approach as a teacher, but they approach as a, they, they, they came as a, as a partner um, to just have a look. And at the end, it was the achievement of the third part of the um, last part of the list uh, that they also uh, went up in the list and others, of course, you have always a last part of a list, but they went up in the, in the, in the ranking uh, because they had an achievement and they were very proud about that. So generate pride about the achievements that people do. I think it's not only for sustainability, but also in sustainability in particular in this energy consumption part that helped a lot to convince people uh, that they are on the right track what they are doing. The cow nudge. Uh, yeah. rather than kick but really get it in the hearts and minds what are your tips um let me let me offer you um, a threefold answer with with one addition if i may first of all i think today our task is much easier than it was four or five years ago when i recall back then um you were you were either regarded as 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 somebody who was um I use again the expression Lucy in the sky, not business oriented, if you were talking about sustainability, or you were even regarded as the policeman who is telling the others what they should do and what they uh, should not do. I think this has significantly changed. Number two, I think that the uh, generation gap uh, in the perception towards sustainability is significantly declining. We saw that uh, in the early days, it was particularly uh, the younger age group that was very much into sustainability. It was even a differentiating factor um, in the, on the labor market. Uh, nowadays, I see that also uh, people um, of our age and even older, they really get the concept and we're able to make them enthusiastic about what we do. What we do. How are we doing it? Um, first of all, again, great examples from, from Thomas. Um, to give you some real life examples of what we are doing, uh, we've got our annual stakeholder forum. Um, and uh, we do this every year around September, October for one and a half days. What we started doing in the past together uh, with um, my colleague, David Hart and, and his colleagues uh, from the communications department, we started reporting about it almost in a life character. I, I wouldn't say it was like a football game, but during the one and a half days, we would have had um, six to seven different uh, feeds that we were using for intranet, that we were using for LinkedIn and for other messages. So we were really, and, and I like the term much, we were really nudging our people uh, and taking them along the way and feeding them with the messages um, of what we were doing. Um, th that is more, let's say, the push part. There is also the pull part. Um, we at, at Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling, we are very famous about volunteering initiatives. Now, let me tell you something, Richard. In the past, I wasn't a big fan of volunteering. For me, this was a little bit, you know, fluffy, greenwashing, kind of, okay, you, you want to be, but not really. I have fundamentally changed my mind for the following reason. Not so much for the external stakeholder world, but uh, more so internally. The more people uh, that we engage internally, that we take along, whether that's in Croatia uh, at the Adriatic Sea or whether that's in Romania along the shores of the Danube or in Poland or anywhere else, you, you're, you make those people and those colleagues aware of what you're doing. 
and the more plastic and trash they find somewhere there and they put in the bags and they make sure that this is then also uh, uh, dedicated towards uh, a proper recycling stream, the more we make them not only aware of what we're doing, but we're making them really proud. And the final thing, the addition to, to those three points, if, if you allow me for that, um, and that relates a little bit back to your intro, Richard, I would very much encourage each and every one to treat sustainability in the same way as you treat each and every business issue. And that starts with a proper governance cycle. And that was what, what Thomas referred to when he was talking about awareness and, and, and transparency. Uh, the more you treat sustainability in the internal governance cycle, and that starts actually with the business planning. You make sure that sustainability is part of your internal business planning. You make sure that there is, whether it's a quarterly or a half year reporting process, first internally and then externally, you will also uh, realize and you will guarantee that your people internally will incrementally take the topic seriously. Can I just, just ask Thomas to pick up that last point because we've had a, a question from Adrian Brown who's um, specifically asking about governance in terms of changing the culture for, for net zero. Is, is governance an important part of what Henkel is doing as well? Yeah, of course, um, because you, you, have to, you have to coordinate. We have three business units, adhesives, beauty care, uh, lawn and home care, uh, and to coordinate between the, the three business units, but also the functions. So uh, research, manufacturing, um, uh, marketing. Um, so there's a, there's a government team, um, and we had a so-called sustainability council, we, we call it, where there is, um, I'm the co-lead, and together with me, there is a, a member of the, of the board, uh, man management board, um, and um, Sylvie Nicole, and I'm the, the co-lead of this, of this council. Uh, and in the council, are all functions and all business units were presented. So, and there we, uh, they, they meet uh, in, a, in a six to eight weeks um, sequence. Uh, and, um, uh, and and all, all the topics are discussed. So first there's a reporting session, then there's a strategic part, and then is an, uh, an action part, what has to be done next. Uh, and, and there is um, uh, also um, an, an external view, what, what others are doing, what, uh, what, what uh, policy is coming in from the, from the outside. So there's, um, there's, we, we share information, but also we decide there. So the board, uh, management board has entitled this team to make at least pre-decisions, so if we spend, if we want to spend um, a big, bigger amounts of money, of course, we make a, make a, uh, um, a proposal for, for a decision, but this board is entitled to, to run the, uh, and to, to, cover, to bring the governance into, into sustainability. Very helpful. Um, also following up, um, um, the, um, the achievements um, that we do in a normal process, by the way, monthly, but uh, every six to eight weeks in the sustainability council, we discuss it even in the team. Okay, really good example, case example as well. I know a lot of people will be listening to that. Lots of questions coming in on Slido. We invite more, but there's there's quite a few that are saying to your uh, companies, one from Deborah, one from Gabriel Slaughter, um, accepting that you are beacon leading companies in this field, managing the culture in the way we've been discussing in this session, but saying at one and the same time, you're part of trade associations, perhaps giving money to business associations that don't have the same commitment to net zero and even uh, lobby for fossil fuels. I don't want to personalise it around either of your companies, so I think it's a good question for both of you. Is that a challenge in your relationships with others in the, in the business world? And how do you try to manage that so that your own uh, commitment within your own business culture isn't impaired or um, uh, uh, diminished in some way? Michael first. Yeah, listen, I think there was always, it's part, it's the nature of the game that uh, there will be uh, fast movers and there will be fast followers and then there will be potentially businesses that are, that are lacking behind to a certain extent. Um, when you look at the exploratory nature of sustainability, for me, this is inherent. What is important is that you've got businesses that are taking the lead and that uh, display the positive example. I can proudly say that uh, in, in, in several areas, we are doing that um, as Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling Company, as is confirmed by uh, the different uh, sustainability benchmarks. But we're also working very closely 
um, in our trade associations uh, with uh, the uh, with peers uh, and with other uh, bottlers um, and beyond that with beverage companies. I think there is a very healthy cross fertilization of initiatives and you know sometimes we at Hellenic we are first and we're very proud about that and in other instances it might be a different business and then we are also very proud in in copying what they are doing and making sure that in the next cycle we are exceeding what they are doing. Um, by all of that what I'm trying to say but my personal mindset and the way that I'm looking um, at this uh, overall approach is I believe very much in the power of the positive example of persuasion of walking the talk if you're doing the right things the others will follow undoubtedly so for me it is more um a a pull rather than a push same question to thomas please yep um i will give you an example in particular on um, uh, on zero net zero um i personally joined the um working group uh that worked on the um um, way forward the roadmap uh, for a net zero chemical industry in Germany. And uh, here we talk really about uh, um, um, a really a, a big, big challenge um, because chemical industry, uh, I think when they make, may make the roadmap to their way to, to net zero, that is much more different than other industries that run filling machines. Uh, and, you know, we are even in the middle part. So we have our adhesive business is for sure Part of chemical industry but you know beauty and um, uh, home and personal care um, you won't see directly as a chemical uh, a business better not so um, we are brand owners so but i joined this team just to bring the the topic that the need is there that um, our consumers uh, but also our customers ask us for something to do and we need the chemicals from the chemical industry that fulfill that that, that part to make it um, let's say um, here it's, I wouldn't say a kick anymore, but I say here it was a push and to give the, the right push in the right direction that the end point of this roadmap process um, has to be uh, a way how this roadmap comes to a success and not, uh, um, let's say there's always temptation to prove that this uh, is such a big, uh, a big job that it cannot be done or not done in 20 or 30 years. Um, so that could be also a part that um, that companies like Coca-Cola in their um, trade associations and uh, and we as a as a company can can do and uh, and play a role from our special positions also to uh, to even uh, to even pull uh, in in the right direction. That is what what I see. Uh, last point is uh, that is not net zero on climate, but uh, at the end hopefully sometimes net zero on ocean uh, leakage on on plastic, the alliance to end plastic waste. Um, that is uh, then also an, also kind of not a trade association, but an association formed only by companies and even driven by the CEOs themselves or run by the CMOs themselves uh, by an, an, for the entire value chain where everybody comes together who wants to be in the forefront. But we are completely open to everybody to join us. Um, that is uh, even at the time being close to 50 companies uh, from those who are making plastic, those who are collecting plastic and those who are using a plastic um, to, to work against um, a plastic waste. Uh, and that is also a, a new way of if they're your own trade organization doesn't, is not helpful, maybe you find others, peers, to find a new kind of organization to bring the thing forward. That, that's a really good answer uh, and uh, developing these new coalitions perhaps I was, as I was listening I was thinking perhaps employees need a nudge but business associations sometimes need a kick so um, probably time for a couple more questions um, I'm working at the moment on the on transparency issues reform of the EU non-financial reporting directive um, and I've been struck how both of you talked about transparency uh, reporting, internal, external verification being an important part of your credibility to get manage this cultural change. So this is not a session about reporting per se, but I just just wonder when you know I've seen that the vast majority of companies are not using targets which are aligned to Paris or SDG goals, or they've got policies there but no um tracking of how far they're being achieved that's not the case in your companies but it is the case in the vast majority of companies in europe and europe's probably the leading region what is your your message about how you have been able to do to do that 
um, with credibility for yourselves. Michael. I'm afraid I've got a, a rather unorthodox answer to that. Um, there is reporting and there is reporting. And you can either comply to the standards, uh, and, and we all are aware of these, or you can tell a story. Now, I believe uh, the times where it was sufficient for a business to hammer out a 220 pages report on sustainability, they are gone. Because personally, I believe you need to have uh, a lot of problems falling asleep at night to read such a report from the starting to the very end. So the very basic minimum indeed is that you comply to the standards and that you um, raise your profile in terms of transparency. However, the name of the game nowadays is how do you tell your story? How do you set up an uh, appealing narrative that is making sure that the stakeholders, those that you want to reach by means of your uh, reporting are actually not only receiving uh, the message, but they are also reading it and ideally they are even engaged with what you have been uh, writing and what you have been setting up. Okay, just one minute on that because time is against us, Thomas. One minute on that one, please. Um, then very short uh, on, on, on that topic. Um, <clears throat> I think you cannot live without um, if you want to be uh, have credibility and take even your, your, your people and external people with you, uh, in particular, the financial world. Analysts are more and more asking for that. For, the, for example, uh, in, in particular, if what, what you are doing against climate change uh, or for the climate target is important to make also your business resilient for the future. Uh, and this is also a part of uh, part of that reporting, because otherwise you, you cannot have a future in a, uh, in a, in a climate change world. Okay, thank you for both that. One final question for both of you, and again, it's only about a minute for the answer, apologies. But uh, we've, we've been trying to address how you get business culture for net zero. Um, Mikhail, how, how do you know it's happened? How do you, when you walk in or you speak to someone in the company, how do you know for yourself that cultural change has happened? How do you detect it for yourself? The short one minute answer to that is twofold. Number one, I, I see it when, I, when we achieve the targets, uh, the annual targets that we set out as part of our mission 2025 for our sustainability strategy. And the second leg to that is uh, when we get to a level where we are actually pushed, where we are nudged by our colleagues, they send us information about peers. They send us information about what is happening in the markets. They share with us opportunities and they ask us, hey, how about we go into this direction or we share uh, this information or we join that uh, coalition. If you get to that level, then you know you're really in the sweet spot of uh, mutual engagement. Great answer. How do you know it's really happening, Thomas? Yeah, I can, I can join Michael. So my, my answer would have, would have been to say if we if we um, get every day uh, hundreds of mails and posts um, about uh, new ideas, what we can do uh, and sustainability further on, uh, on top um, what, what we are, have already uh, published and, and what, we are, what we are really doing. And I would add another thing is um, we have this um, kind of uh, corporate volunteering trash fighters, for example, is an initiative, a global initiative in our company, um, and also people going to schools and, and train um, young students in sustainability, what is really making not only your, yourself very happy, but, um, but you, you get also the, um, uh, a, a very positive feedback um, by that, and you learn what you are teaching. Huh? That, is, uh, that is always the good effect. If we have more of these um, ideas of, of, of personal volunteering beyond the job, uh, beside the ideas what we can do on the job, uh, then we know that we are there. Brilliant answers from two really great companies. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we've heard in the last 45 minutes that it's a bit of push and it's a bit of pull. They go together, that it definitely has to be built into the governance of the company. But I think the point I'll take most is that uh, aspiration is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, it's actually a necessary thing if, in, if we're in order to achieve this goal. Mikhail, Thomas, thank you so much for a very rich discussion. Back to Liam. Thanks for the questions. Thanks a lot both to you.